Uh, Paul Myers was a very successful radio personality in the early 1930s. Maybe some of you know of him. His first wife died shortly after the birth of their first child, their first baby girl, Marilyn. Well, Paul remarried, and he remarried a wonderful woman by the name of Thelma. And Thelma raised not only Marilyn, but three additional children, so she raised four children. But Paul has some problems. He has some significant problems. You see, Paul liked to drink, and he liked to disappear from home. And when he would disappear from home, he would disappear for quite a long time. And sometimes he would disappear to get drunk. Other times he would disappear to see other women. Sometimes he would disappear to do both. Well, night after night, Thelma would be left alone with the children. And oftentimes those children were sick. Through the trials, Thelma had become a Christian. More importantly and significantly, a praying one. Every night she would pray over her children, and one by one, each child came to faith in Christ. Even more amazing, for ten long years, she continued to pray for her husband, Paul. Now, during that time, he'd been gone a long, long time. But she continued to pray that God would touch his soul. No idea where he was, but a pretty good idea of what he was doing. Far away, all the way across the country, it was foggy. And Paul Meyer sat on a dark and lonely wharf in California. Cardboard in the soles of his shoes had worn out. But the aching in his soul had worn in. While he was on that wharf, in the midst of all that fog, the memories start to flood his mind. Faces of his wife, or the face of his wife, faces of his children, would appear to him again and again. And as the waves would hit the docks, waves of awful condemnation and shame began to flood over him. There in the silence of the night, in the midst of that dark fog, he begins to hear bells. Two bells, four bells, eight bells. Now he'd been in a drunken stupor all night, but he knew what eight bells meant. Eight bells meant all is well. But for Paul, he knew that all wasn't well. He began to remember all of the hymns that his mother had taught him. He remembered the times his wife Thelma had pleaded for him to surrender to Christ. And in that night he begins, he finds his way back to his cheap hotel. And he found a Bible in the desk drawer of that hotel. And on that cold and foggy night, Paul Myers gave his life to Christ. The next day, Paul sends a telegram to Thelma. And he simply says, thank him for a direct answer. Then he begins the long journey home. And he comes home wondering, would his wife and would his children take him back? After all he had done, all the time that he was gone, all that they knew about what he was doing while he was gone, he's wondering, would they take him back? Well, Thelma saw him, and she breaks into tears, and he responds, he says, I've come home. I've found Christ. Well, in March of 1934, Paul Myers, known as First Mate Bob, began what is called the Haven of Rest. He began the program every day by saying, Ahoy there, shipmate. Eight bells and all's well. Some 85 years later, 
The ministry has reached millions for the cause of Jesus Christ. Many of us enjoy the music of the Haven Quartet as they've ministered to hearts and souls throughout decades. The program begins with them singing, I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest. Paul Myers learned what we all need to learn, and that is this. If we are going to find rest for our souls, then our rest must be solely found in Christ. If we're going to find our haven of rest, then our haven can only, only be found in Jesus Christ. Turn with me this morning, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, and I want us to look at verses 14 through 16. A short passage for sure, but it's going to cause us to turn our eyes upon Jesus, and to look full into his wondrous face. Hebrews chapter 4, beginning with verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, and Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of of grace that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of need. If we are going to find rest for our souls, then we need to know that it can only be found in Christ. We are going to look at this passage over two Sundays. And we're going to find, as it rolls out, that we find our rest in the person of Christ. We find our rest in the perfection of Christ. And then we find our rest in the very presence of Christ. This morning, I want us to focus on finding our rest in the person of Christ in verse 14. In verse 14, we can find that we rest in Christ's position, we rest in Christ's provisions, and then we can rest in our Christian profession. Verse 14, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. First of all, we can rest in Christ's position. We can rest in Christ's position as our great high priest. Incredible emphasis is placed upon this in the book of Hebrews for a whole myriad of reasons. We rest in his position as our great high priest. Megas is used typically of that which is large, that which is huge, that which is massive and typically denotes quantity. We think in terms of megahertz, mega church, mega mall. That which is very large in its amounts, in its quantity. But here the term great high priest is used of quality, denotes the quality of excellence. And in addition, Christ's greatness is expressed in the language of transcendence, not quantity, but quality. He's passed through the heavens in the very presence of God and therefore the mediator between man and God. And the writer of Hebrews emphasizes that Christ is not just any other priest, not even close to any other priest, or better rendered, no other priest is even close to him. He is 
superior, far superior than any, any other priest could ever, ever come close to. In fact, as you would read through the book of Hebrews, you would find that theme throughout. The Christ is superior to the angels, superior to Moses, superior over all. And he's superior in this sense that he doesn't have to make sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice like the Old Testament priests would. He doesn't have to enter into the tabernacle year after year after year after year, fearful that he might be rejected. In addition, Christ's priesthood is eternal. It's also unchangeable and it's irrevocable in the sense that he abides forever. Uh, Turn, if you would, over just a few pages to Hebrews chapter 7. And I want us to look at verses 23 and following. And the former priests, on the one hand, existed in greater numbers. In other words, a mega amount of numbers, because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, on the other hand, because he abides forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Hence also he's able to save forever those who draw near to God through him. And by the way, there's no other way to draw near to God except through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins, and then for the sins of the people. Because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath, which came after the law, appoints the Son, made perfect forever. And the writer of Hebrews now really highlights in bold faces the next expression. Now the main point in what has been said is this. In other words, all of that data, all of that truth leads us to a place. And here it is. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched, not man. We can rest in Christ's position as our great high priest. We can rest in Christ's position as Jesus, the Son of God. The writer uses a qualifying statement concerning this high priest. He's not like any other. For this high priest is fully God and fully man. Or better rendered, fully man and fully God. The words are exact. They're pointed. We have a great high priest, Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus denoting his humanity. And it stresses Christ's incarnation and his earthly ministry, everything that we just celebrated over the Christmas season. But the Son of God denotes Christ's deity. And it stresses his resurrection and his glorification. There's a son of God, he's the one with father, reigning with all rule and authority. And therefore, he is in the perfect position to protect us, to preserve us, and to empower us. As the son of God, he's the head of the church. He's our great shepherd. He's the vine, we are the branches. He's the cornerstone, the bedrock of the church. He's the He's the the bridegroom, and we're the bride, the author of creation, the author of faith. 
So if we're going to find rest for our souls, then our rest must be solely found in Jesus Christ. If there was ever a time to get this truth nailed down in our hearts, now's the time that we can look to the one who is able, more than able, to carry us through the deepest crises that we will ever face in our lives. That he's there to strengthen, to empower, to enable. But more importantly, I think sometimes we forget that he is there reigning and ruling. And while he is doing so, Scripture tells us that he's praying. Now, we think of that oftentimes through the lenses of the third person of the Trinity and the Holy Spirit who intercedes for us when we can't pray, with groanings too deep for words. Those moments in life where we can't even utter a 911 prayer and all we could do is go, ugh, ugh, groaning too deep for words. The Holy Spirit then interceding on our behalf, knowing exactly where we're at, exactly how we feel, exactly what we need. And bringing that and delivering that with perfection to our Heavenly Father. We often think that Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, seated in heavenly places, is in the perfect position to intercede for us. And while we're praying to him, He's interceding in our behalf for us. I think we forget that sometimes, that he's more than in our corner. He's in us, and he's praying our way through the unimaginable, helping us to get through valleys far too low and climb mountains far too high, that he's there, always always there. We rest in Christ's position because where he is allows him to do what only he can do. But secondly, we can rest in Christ's provisions. We rest fully in his provisions for us as high priests. but his provisions for us because he's our high priest, that he offered the perfect sacrifice. Not a goat, not a pigeon, but himself. That Christ is the offerer and the offering, therefore satisfying God's wrath. Each year on the Day of Atonement, you study the Old Testament. The high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies. And only the high priest could do that. Nobody else could. You entered into that place, you struck dead. And if anybody thought you were going to try to get in there, they would probably strike you dead as well in order to protect the law and to honor God. Only the high priest could enter in. And each year on that Day of Atonement, he would take one lamb and he would place the blood of that lamb on the mercy seat to atone for sins. The very big deal for the nation of Israel and anybody that was a follower and a believer in God. Because that Day of Atonement was there to wash over all of the sins of the nation, but not just the nation, those individuals who were carrying the burden and the guilt and the shame of sin. That high priest would enter in, he would take that blood, and he would place it upon the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. And then he would take a second lamb and place the sins on the people. And that lamb, lamb was called scapegoat. And all of those sins, all that guilt, all that shame, would be placed on that scapegoat. And that scapegoat was sent out into the wilderness to disappear and to die. 
not to be remembered, not to be reminded, but to be carried away. And in that time frame, the nation would sense a level of God's forgiveness, a level of peace, a level of restoration, one day out of the year. And scholars would say that they would tie a rope around the ankle of the great high priest. Because if he went in there and God were not satisfied, that high priest would be struck dead and nobody could get him out, so they would drag him out with the rope. A sense of seriousness, spiritual heightened awareness of being before a holy God. The scripture tells us that Christ as our high priest offered the sacrifice of himself and he laid his life on the cross and there's the perfect ransom price to redeem us and purchase us for himself. It's the whole concept of propitiation. Big lofty words that we're told not to use, but they're found in the pages of Scripture. For as he, he is our propitiation. He's our mercy as well as the mercy seat. He is the sacrifice, and he's the sacrificer in order to appease once for all the wrath of of God. And so Christ reconciles us towards God in that the animosity is turned to love and trust. And then his perfect position, he is there to intercede on our behalf to pray for us. And he's in the perfect position with perfect power to serve as our advocate and to serve to defend us. Turn again, if you would, over to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, He entered in the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and confession upon confession upon confession and the ashes of heifers sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, Cleanse your conscience from the dead works to serve the living God. Look at verses 24 through 26. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one. In other words, the holy of holies here on earth in the tabernacle versus the holy of holies right in the very presence of God a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he should offer himself often. As the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood and not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundations of the world But now once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, shall appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await for him. Glance one chapter over. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 through 14. 
By this will we've been sanctified through the offerings of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. When I'm reminded of these incredible truths, I'm often reminded of where I was at before Christ. Where we would be without Christ. What it would be like if we were still under the Old Testament law. I don't know about you, but there are not enough goats, not enough lambs, not enough pigeons to take care of the likes of me. That every day, I'd be wandering around, not overwhelmed by a lot of things in this world, but overwhelmed by the fact that i got to get another goat. And go to the... T- Go to the temple and sacrifice again and again and again and again. I'm also reminded as a pastor, I'm quite grateful and thankful that I don't have to serve as a priest back then. Because that's all I'd be doing is goat after goat after goat after goat. Did you ever think of the amount of blood? The amount of sacrifice? I know how many ghosts and lambs I might need, but if I have to take all of you collectively, eh. after about two days, I'd be get your life right and stop coming back here. It's never ending. I have good friends, and maybe you came through this and my dad did. He's fearful of God. He grew up in the Catholic Church. We're just punished. And the nuns would take the old rulers with the little steel edge on him and whack his fingers. I mean, he's afraid. Confession after confession after confession after confession, always wondering, always living under the shadow of all that sin and all that shame. And the scripture tells us all that ever did was point to the Savior to come. It was a shadow. It was a type. It was to bring us to the place of awareness of of the tragedy of sin and the horror of it all and God's hatred of it all. But God's solution to it all would come through his Son that once for all, all. Our Savior took it upon himself. All that pain, all that guilt, all that sorrow, all that shame, heaped, I mean heaped is the word that the scriptures would use, heaped upon him the weight of it all, the horror of it all, as he took it all upon him so that he could wash it all away by his blood. And because of that, I can get a hug from my heavenly father instead of hiding away in fear and shame. Pretty amazing to me. So we can rest in Christ, knowing that He's in heaven to defend us with every accusation that the enemy can rail against us. Oh, he did that, or she thought that, and na 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 na. Trying to take us out, trying to take us down. Every 
every time that happens, Christ is our advocate. He is our legal representation before the Father. With every accusation the enemy throws, our Lord and Savior says, not guilty. Innocent. Pure. Undefiled. How he sees our messed upness. But above and beyond that, The Father sees his Son in us, over us, through us. And we stand righteous before a righteous God. He's defending us. He's in heaven praying for us, interceding for us. As our great high priest, when he prays, can you imagine when he prays? You ever pray and feel like you're fumbling your way through it? awkward before men and our Heavenly Father. When Christ prays, he prays with excellence. I've heard men and women pray great prayers. It's as if they have the gift of intercession. And they just pray. and They bring us into the presence of God. I've read great prayers. I've read the Apostle Paul's great prayers in Scripture. Made it feel like heaven on earth for a moment. But when Christ prays, all of heaven stands still and hangs on his every word. Stands in our defense. Prays on our behalf and then sends out his angelic troops to come alongside and help. We have no idea, men and women, of what goes on in that celestial realm. We have glimpses of it from Scripture, but we have no idea of how our Lord is commanding his troops on our behalf so that we have victory and our enemy never has. But we can rest fully in Christ's provision for us as the Son of God as well. As a man, Christ can understand the difficulties of humanity. He understands the trials. He understands the pain. It's not enough that he created humanity. He became part of humanity. He can provide the love we need, the care we need, the comfort we need, the tenderness we need because he understands it. And as God is in a position to meet our every need, to know it fully, to know it perfectly, and as God is able to provide abundantly beyond what we can ask or we think because he knows. Tempted in every way, like us yet without sin. Hurting in every way possible, like us. And so he can say, I know your frame. I know your predicament. I know what it's like to be betrayed. I know what it's like to be abandoned. I know what it's like to hurt. I know what it's like to be bruised, to be beaten. As the head of the church, he provides the power, the guidance, our growth. As the Lord of our lives, he's sovereign over every hair on our head and every detail of our lives. And as our great shepherd, he carries us when we're weak, feeds us when we're hungry, protects us from our enemies, and he quiets our souls so we can rest. In him we find our atonement, our redemption, our adoption, and our reconciliation. That through him, We're justified, sanctified, and one day we'll be glorified. The writer of Hebrews is slowing us down to say, just sit still and ponder upon this and cease striving and know that I am God. Well, because we can rest in Christ's position, 
and we can rest in Christ's provisions. Therefore, the writer tells us, we can rest in our Christian profession. The writer begins verse 14 with an incredible expression of intimacy. Look at the passage again. Since we have. It's a very simple word in the Greek. Echo. Here it means to have, to be closely joined to another person or to hold tightly to someone. The term speaks of a committed relationship such as marriage. We use the expression to have and to hold from this day forevermore. What God has joined together is one. Let no one tear asunder. And Paul would tell us that imagery is not of the husband and the wife, but of Christ and the church. To have and to hold. And that's the language here, echo. Since we have, we are to hold. And more importantly, we often forget we are to be held. The phrase provides the reason why we are admonished then to hold fast our confession. Since we have to have and to hold. Since we have so much in him. Let us hold tightly to our confession. Let us fasten to our faith. Hold fast our confession and stick tightly to our profession of faith. Hamalagia is used of a specific formulation of faith. Jesus, the Son of God, seemed to be used consistently In the early church, people understood it, people knew it, and people expressed it. It was widely accepted by the community of faith, openly acknowledged, and the confession was to be kept carefully, maintained faithfully, and held to tightly. Fully God, fully man. And then krateo literally means to cling to tenaciously, to keep holding fast, to seize completely. Came across an interesting story on a commuter flight from Portland, Maine to Boston. A gentleman by the name of Henry Dempsey, the pilot of the craft, heard an unusual noise near the rear of the small aircraft as they were taking off. Turned the controls over to his co-pilot. He went into the back of the plane to check out the noise. As he reached the tail section, the plane hit an air pocket. If you've ever felt that in a plane, it's terrifying. Hit an air pocket. And Dempsey was tossed against the rear door. He quickly discovered the source of the mysterious noise. Because the rear door had not been properly latched prior to takeoff, and it flew open. And Henry Dempsey was literally sucked out of the plane. Well, the co-pilot, seeing the red light that indicated an open door, looking back and not seeing Dempsey, radioed the nearest airport, requesting permission to make an emergency landing. And he then requested a helicopter search that area of the ocean that they had been over to look for Dempsey. Well, after the plane landed, they found Henry Dempsey. Not out in the ocean. Holding on to the outdoor ladder of the aircraft. Somehow, he had caught the ladder. And he held on for 10 minutes as that plane flew 200 miles an hour from an altitude of 4,000 feet. And then at landing, kept his head from hitting the runway, which was a mere 12 inches away from him. Now, as you could only imagine, 
it took airport personnel quite a while to pry Henry Dempsey's fingers from the ladder. In a state of shock at this point, Dempsey continued to hang on for dear, dear life. And they couldn't get him to let go. You ever feel like you're going 200 miles an hour and you're crashing from 4,000 feet? You ever feel like you've just been sucked out of the plane and you're headed for a free fall? You may not know this, but Scripture describes Jesus Christ as the ladder. In the Old Testament, Jacob saw a ladder from heaven to earth, and the angels were going up and down from it. If you look early in John, I believe it's chapter 2, you'll see that Christ is described as the ladder. And the angels are descending up and down along the ladder. It's interesting imagery. In the midst of the turmoil, we are to hold fast tenaciously to cling to what we profess, clinging to the word, clinging to the cross, clinging to Christ alone, since you have a great high priest, Jesus, the Son of God, all that he is and all that he does, since you have, hold tightly to the King kings. They say that confession is good for the soul. But it's only good when the confession is Christ. Hold fast to your confession. Confession is great for the soul when our confession is Jesus Christ. We can rest in the fact that we have a great high priest in heaven, that the Son of God is our Savior, that Christ is worthy of our confession. And only when he is our confession will we truly find rest for our souls. The story is told of a surgeon and a young boy, and that young boy had a heart condition, needed surgery. Tomorrow morning, the surgeon began, I'll open up your heart. And you'll find Jesus there, the boy interrupted. The surgeon looked up annoyed. He said, I'm, I'm going to cut your heart open, he continued, to see how much damage has been done. But when you open up my heart, you'll find Jesus in there. The surgeon looked to the parents and sat quietly. When I see how much damage has been done, I'll sew your heart and your chest back up, and then I'll plan what we need to do next. But you'll find Jesus in my heart. The Bible says he lives there. The hymns all say he lives there. You're going to find him in my heart. But by this time, the surgeon had had enough. He says, I'll tell you what I'll, I'll find in your heart. I'll find damaged muscle, low blood supply. I'll find weakened vessels. And then I'll find out if I can make you well. But you'll find Jesus there too. He lives there. Well, the surgeon left. The surgeon sat in his office Hours later, recording his notes from the surgery. Damaged aorta, damaged pulmonary vein, widespread muscle degeneration. No hope for transplant, no hope for cure. 
Therapy, painkillers, and bed rest. Prognosis, and here he paused. Death within a year. He stopped the recorder. But there's more to be said. Why, he asked aloud, why did you do this? You've put this boy here, you've put him in this pain, and you've cursed him to an early death. Why? And the Lord answered and said, The boy, my lamb, is not meant for your flock for long. It's part of my flock, will forever be. Here in my flock, he's going to feel no pain. He'll be comforted, as you cannot imagine. And his parents will one day join him here, and they too will know peace. And my flock is going to continue to grow. Surgeon's tears were hot, but his anger even hotter. You created that boy, and you created that heart, and he will be dead in months. Why? The Lord answered the boy, my lamb shall return to my flock, for he's done his duty. I didn't put that precious lamb in your flock to lose him, but to retrieve another lost lamb. And that surgeon, dry, cold, and bewildered, began to weep. He sat beside the boy's bed. The parents sat across from him. And the boy awoke and whispered, Did you cut open my heart? Yes, said the surgeon. And what did you find? Asked the little boy. And the surgeon said, I found Jesus there. Since we have, since we have, let us hold fast to all he is, all he can do. Let's pray. May it be, Father, that we worship you, and in worshiping your Son, our Lord Jesus, holding tightly onto him, always aware that as tightly as we can ever hold, you're always holding far tighter onto us. We love you. We worship you. And we praise you in Christ's name. Amen.